scientist, rock star, innovator, fucker, uh, Alan Barkin. Um, crisis about creativity. I am the Coast Guard uh, Innovation Program Manager. My name is Andy Howell. I have been in the Coast Guard for 22 years. Um, I am a pilot. I've also uh, done a lot of ship driving and boat driving, and uh, now I drive policy, uh, which, is, uh, which is even better. Um, it's more exciting, more risky uh, for your career. Uh, Tyson, Tyson Wyatt is here uh, from uh, Luma Institute. He's the guy who kind of built uh, this program uh, that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the Coast Guard, if you are not familiar with it, um, is a military organization, also a federal law enforcement organization. $10 billion a year, 18,000 members, counting our volunteers. Um, we are worldwide. We um, are an armed service. We do what you're familiar with, which is search and rescue and uh, uh, drug enforcement. But we also do um, um, oil spill response. We do all of merchant mar mariner credentialing. We do inspections on every commercial vessel, port. Um, we maintain all the nation's waterways. Um, and uh, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun too. Um, but uh, the Coast Guard, we, we have uh, this thing that we call the curse of simple for us, which is, uh, the, which is our action bias. We are a response-oriented organization, really all of DHS sprung out of a, a crisis, uh, and we kind of maintain that crisis uh, thinking all the time. Um, that action bias that we have um, doesn't make us great planners, it doesn't make us great strategists, it doesn't make us great, um, uh, you know, we would, we would not be able to get past the first uh, column in the Tesla uh, spreadsheet. <laughs> so we would much rather just go, go, out, go out and do it. Um, However, our commandant, a guy named Paul Zukunft, which means future in German, uh, he has given us this marching order here. This is his guiding principles. It says, we will foster an organization capable of continuous innovation and learning. Uh, and kind of my theme today is that these two things are actually kind of opposed to each other, uh, mm -hmm. continuous innovation and organizational learning. They shouldn't be, but they are. Um, so this is that's pretty easy, right? Uh, so, uh, continuous innovation. Um, we have a very young workforce. We have a, it's not anywhere near as diverse as we would like it to be, but it's a pretty diverse workforce. And uh, as far as I can perceive, um, nobody puts more uh, responsibility or autonomy on more junior people than we do. We take a 19 year old and we give them a gun and we give them a boat or her and we said go. There's something weird happening 100 miles Offshore, go figure it out, it's fine. <laughs> and, they, and they do it, they have a helicopter, you know, whatever, and they go do it and they are successful every time. Every case that they go do is different from the last one. And uh, they get out there and frankly they end it. They figure it out, they, and they never, never fail. Uh, so we, so the continuous innovation part from at the workforce perspective, at the lowest level is, is very strong. Um, this here, as, a, as an example, we, have, we maintain the nation's waterways, which means we work all the buoys. And these buoys are, you know, they're as tall as this, uh, as this room. They have this huge chain that hangs down underneath them. I mean, the links are huge. And uh, so these boats that are like these big giant pickup trucks go pick them up, and put the buoys on the deck, and they paint them and scrape all the barnacles off them. Well, the chain, it's like a tug of war with this chain, and they have a huge Mall. This is like a 25-pound mall sledgehammer, and they also have this huge uh, uh, cast iron hook that they use to pull this chain around. So they have these two heavy hand tools that they're juggling while the boat is, you know, while they're in the Bering Sea doing this. Uh, so this kid, and and I, I know that sounds like uh, diminishing, but they are children. Uh, <laughs> uh, said I'm sick of carrying these two things around and tripping over one and picking one up and putting one down. So you weld them together. And, um, you know, this are the diamond bullets for an innovation uh, program because it's like, uh, it's like a work of art when you see it. You're like, oh, yeah, of course. And you show this to an admiral, and they're like, well, we've been doing this job for 150 years. Surely we've, we've, we have this, and we're doing this. And the answer is maybe we did somewhere along the way, but it never had an opportunity to be shared amongst the entire workforce. There was no, you know, transparent uh, way to share ideas. So... Um, at the lowest level, 
Uh, we have this, these innovative uh, girls and boys out there doing cool stuff, like welding, welding stuff together to get the job done. At the senior level, we have um, some visionary leaders, but at this upper middle management level, which is like 05s, 06s, GS14s, GS15s, um, of which I am you know, a proud member, we have this permafrost that you can't get through. The Coast Guard, the size and the shape and the course and the speed of a government institution is determined by the authorization, authorization bill and the appropriations bill and the, what we call the program of record and a hundred other things that we just can't change. I mean, the, the, the nibble that you can take at the margin is small and we, the, you know, this frozen middle, this permafrost, um, can't. Just, we just can't. We just don't even want to hear it. I, like, I don't care, kid. You can weld that hammer, I don't want to know about it. Um, so it's very difficult to grow and learn as an organization. Um, the, the institutional learning that the Commonwealth wants us to do um, is not there because we have these people that go out and they just solve problems and they get it done and, and it's fine and we just keep kind of trucking along. So how do we get, how do we get the organization to grow and learn? Well, we have to, we have to trick, we have to trick the organization. We have to, um, we have to, you know, pack, we have to put Brad Pitt in a horse and push him into the, <laughs> into the city. Well, we have to, we have to, we have to, to um, package things in such a way that are um, acceptable and that won't uh, have organ injection, essentially. So, a uh, big opportunity came along, named uh, Harvey. Um, Coast Guard response to Harvey was much, much lauded. Um, we really did a great job. And one of the reasons we did a great job was because we have this awesome workforce. But another reason is that these storms are so close together now that um, the people that responded to Katrina, Deepwater Horizon, Sandy, all had the knowledge management up in their gray matter. They were the same people that went to Harvey, so they just essentially remembered. The institution didn't learn anything from those storms, but the people that responded did. And listen guys, this is family talk. Um, <laughs> this is my, my opinions on the, uh, the um, I love the Coast Guard uh, <laughs> to a, an unhealthy extent. Um, I, my joke is that I am the Coast Guard's stalker ex-boyfriend. <laughs> I say, I love you so, if you could only see how much I love you, <laughs> you would let me fix you and then we'd be so happy. <laughs> uh, so storm, storm comes in and um, I, I go to these big meetings at headquarters and you know, we get this action bias, and even at the at headquarters where we're planning and we're trying to help these guys do good things out in the field, it gets real tense, and these, these upper middle management guys are like, we knew we needed this one thing in Katrina, and we didn't have it, we knew we needed it in Sandy, we didn't have it, now we're showing up, we don't have it. And they're not asking like, why didn't we learn? They're asking, where's that thing we needed? <laughs> so I'm like, hmm, you know. Uh, and I have, you know, I have, uh, oh, so, we have this process to, to, you know, it's SharePoint where you can, during a, a storm, here, Hurricane Harvey lessons learned. And this shows you, <laughs> you know, this is the first of the storm, essentially, you know, like the 27th was kind of where the storm went by. Uh, so, you know, we learned, it's hard. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so, I have my hammer, and I tell you what, man, everything looks like a nail to me. <laughs> and uh, we can say, this is our idea scale stats, and I know that a lot of you have more, a greater percentage of your workforce, but this is actually really pretty good for us. And these guys and gals are like, these are the people that really want to be in there and, and do it for stuff. So, um, I, I have my military chain command um, is one of these things that's very sacred. Uh, and it is a, it's a religious term. Because when you are, you know, in Fallujah and the, and the Sarge says duck, you don't want to say, what might be the best ways that I might duck? <laughs> or how, how might I optimize this ducking? <laughs> you know, just say duck. However, uh, there are times when the chain of command actually stifles um, innovation. I mean, it stifles, stifles good ideas. If I need to say, run something all the way up the chain of command for a um, decision maker to see it, probably along the way, there's so many places where it can get lost or just get shut down by, you know, people like me who uh, don't have time to deal with it. <clears throat> so, um, my boss is out, so I can break the chain of command. I go right into the admiral's office and say, I want to do this, and he says, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> well, we normally have this uh, blurb, because we're military, whenever we run a challenge that says, 
please keep all input um, respectful and constructive. And he's like, no, I don't want any of it. He's like, I want the raw data, man. He's like, I'm sick of these sanitized emails. <laughs> so we launch it, and we get a ton of stuff coming in. This is like midway through. And it's still open. We're still collecting stuff. OK, so as an example of another one of these hammer hook kind of diamond bullets, we get this is a rescue swimmer that says, hey, uh, I know that you, know, you, you put me on the pitched roof in a storm with a chainsaw, and I've never run a chainsaw before. And you know, by the way, guys, that maybe we need some chainsaw training. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so these are the kinds of things where I can just I can shoot it straight and be like, you know, so these are, these are the, these are, I, I'm not using the word easy in my life anymore. I'm just saying straightforward. This is a straightforward uh, thing that we can fix right away. However, the, a lot of weird things that pop in, it's not weird at all, but for us it's weird. Uh, things that, from a much more thematic perspective, can help essentially drag us uh, kicking and screaming into the present. We have never uh, used social media as a uh, distress reporting source before. Um, so um, we started getting distress calls. I have the address uh, blocked out here. But uh, this is during Harvey, the 27th. Um, so this, as a distress notification, is a, really it's better than a phone call or a radio call because all the information is right there. It's got a date timestamp. There's probably location metadata underneath. And it doesn't tie up a phone line or a radio. Um, so it's, we, during the course of the storm, um, started to allow our people to monitor social media for distress notifications. This one is straightforward. It's like a flare that went up. Uh, and this is like, hey, come help me. Um, this is kind of two parentheses. A long, this is a much longer conversation than this. Uh, there was a person that called the Coast Guard Command Center that said, hey, a friend of mine posted a Instagram live video, and I think he's in trouble. Um, can you check his Instagram page and see what you think? Uh, which the answer actually was no, we can't. Um, so uh, one of our junior guys, he just whipped out his phone. He followed this guy on Instagram. <laughs> and Instagram Live, of course, it disappears as soon as it runs. Mm -hmm. and, but he was able to follow this guy on Instagram and um, started direct messaging on Instagram. So this is a direct messaging. Uh, and there's a bunch of things in between here. But you know, this is, hey, I'm in trouble. And this is, hey, I got picked up. Mm -hmm. um, which for us, this is huge. This is like, so we have not advertised it anywhere. Uh, but we are now monitoring social media uh, for distress notifications. And you know, what we've been saying is like, it's like going back a few years and saying, no, you're not allowed to call us on a cell phone, but you, you know, call us on a landline. But <laughs> 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 so we've had, uh, we had a lot of, uh, you know, this is really tricky because there's, there's a lot still with, uh, especially when you have a tiny little social media program, it's one person essentially, Coast Guard headquarters, if bad information gets out there, uh, someone put one of one of our officers' uh, personal cell phone numbers as the Coast Guard distress line <laughs> <laughs> on Facebook, and you know you got to take every single one of those calls because yeah. so many in trouble. So anyway, okay, um, the Coast Guard is a uh, as, as a service. Um, we joined the service so that we would never have a desk job. We joined the service because we want to fly helicopters and airplanes and drive boats and stuff, but the real reason was like, I cannot, like the notion of sitting behind a desk all day is just, I can't do it. Um, however, we treat our people like they are desk bound, even though they are not, and they're not supposed to be. So this person here is doing a storm survey in Port Aransas, Texas, and he's taking pictures of this boat. That's a boat that sunk right there. That's a very top of a boat's cabin right there. Big, that's a great big boat. Uh, and he's using his personal phone, and the expectation is that he does all this work out there, and then he goes all the way back home and sits at his desk and does whatever uh, follow-up he needs to do for all this stuff. Um, so this operational mobility is a big, is probably the, the thing that's going to come out of this. Is like, yeah, we need to standardize uh, some standardized mobility. The other, the other interesting thing about this is that, um, and this is all stuff that we either learned or validated through this Ideascales campaign. Uh, the cell towers during Harvey stayed up and they stayed active, and we have all become so dependent on cellular that we've built all these redundancies into the cell network. So really, this is, this is really where we should be as a disaster response service, and we should be on cellular. You can pop up a Google balloon, or you can do ad hoc cell networks. Uh, a lot easier than trying to get the traditional network. 
Okay, so it's taken a step further, and all of these things are really interrelated. Uh, the first casualty of Hurricane Irma was the T1 line going into this Coast Guard, Coast Guard sector, Houston Gals. So uh, emergency calls are coming in. It's just panic. Uh, you know, it, it's not panic. Chaos, chaos reigning. And then all of a sudden, the network goes out completely. And these are voice over IP phones. And so, I mean, all of a sudden, the Coast Guard is cut off from uh, the emergency. So everybody's cell phones and scraps of paper shuffling to try and manage this case. Well, an auxiliarist, one of our volunteers, opens up his MacBook, turns on his Wi-Fi plug, does a, sets up a, a Google Sheet, gives access to the other air stations and the other command units, and uh, starts putting the, the rest of the, the distress data in there, and all of a sudden everybody can see the same information. And this is for the first time for us. We, we, are, not, we are not in any way uh, in the cloud. And all of a sudden, the chaos just is gone. And everybody's, everybody's able to work, collaborate. Uh, we took it a step farther, and we got this third party, this hacker, to help us um, to help us take that data and make Google Maps over. So now, uh, in the command center, guys are taking these distress calls, putting them into a Google spreadsheet. And one minute later, this updates every minute, all of these are people in distress. The ages are hospitals, but these are all people in distress here. So now the pilot in the plane, or the boat driver, now can take out his or her phone and essentially uh, have a map of where all the cases are. This probably doesn't seem at all revolutionary to many of you, but it's huge for us. <laughs> uh, taking this, and the, this, the next step up from here is, um, this is the old fact behind here. This is the, the DHS, Homeland Security Information Network. So all of the data that comes in gets put in here. It's just this long list that just scroll, scrolls up. It just scrolls up into, like, when it gets off the screen here, we don't know where it goes. It goes in <laughs> some, <laughs> <laughs> So imagine somebody, somebody calls and says, hey, I'm in trouble. Come get me. We say, OK, sir, we'll take your information. Scrolls up to here. Like, like, hey, man, I'm still in trouble. I'm really in trouble here. OK, give me your information. And so with that person, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible information management. We had, so the uh, state of Texas was like, hey, check out this cool web-enhanced uh, mobile app that we have to manage our cases. We're like, oh, we're going to use that. We're going to jump in there. And so we jumped on this, this, Texas, uh, this Texas state platform called GSuite uh, to start. And it, so, so it's like moment by moment, we were improving our information management. We were improving our communications. We were uh, improving our, our ways that we manage the mission. So this is all in the midst of the crisis. And I want to, just to point that out, I want to draw your attention to this right here, the stress info, three feet of water in the house with snakes. So uh, you know, we'll that one gets wrecked up to the top of the list right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the good thing about all of this is that we, doing this collection on idea scale, you, you cannot just, uh, can't, not that anyone would ever ignore it, but now it is in the conventional wisdom. It's in, it's in the common knowledge. Um, people see it and perceive what has happened. The traditional method was to run things up through the chain of command or, or put it on a SharePoint site, which is like you know, throwing a paper airplane out into the, into the hurricane <laughs> and expecting um, some action to be taken. Um, so we have, uh, so here, this is a picture of our Trojan horse here. Um, so we've collected all this stuff and um, provided it to leadership. Leadership has already been in there and seen it all. And uh, it's already leading to, to much better discussions, um, much more mature kind of, uh, hey, you know, we really need to get into the, now that we're 18 years into the 20th, uh, 21st century, let's just, Let's join everybody else. So, <laughs> so um, the kind of the point I want to make is that um, this is really hard, um, and the continuous innovation, having people that can go out and successfully do the job all the time, is huge. I mean, that should be everything. But the problem with that is that we don't, you know, we don't learn nothing, uh, and all, our institutional knowledge is all contained. The uh, idea scale is this is kind of this and right here. So we can take that continuous innovation and we use idea scale and the, and the open 
crowdsourcing nature of idea scale, and connect those two things, and actually turn all that, uh, that awesome ability to go out and do this cool stuff into institutional knowledge. Uh, thus, the drug reports <laughs> for change in the government. Um, anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Is there any kind of reward system connected with it? We do, yes, sir. We have a um, we have an awards program. Um, we um, we just kind of based on some leadership judgment pull a bunch of ideas into one campaign each year. We have we have the Coast Guard has an innovation council, uh, which is a bunch of captains, and they vote on it. Um, the top five come in and have lunch with the commandant, and then shake hands with the commandant, get a coin and a trophy. And a bunch of these guys will be there, and gals will be there. Yes, sir. Um, I used to be in the Navy, so this was interesting because I totally related to how uh, you have the chain of command and some things, and things get stuck. Or, um, but what was most interesting is is how I, I think the word social media has a negative connotation yeah. with military leadership. So it was interesting how you were able to show how social media. Yeah. Uh, was able to really save lives yes. in this yes. case. So I thought that was pretty uh, interesting. The next, the next question is, we, our social media person is one GS-14 in Coast Guard headquarters. So the next question, now we do have a policy that says we are, we're not advertising it, we don't want anyone to know, <laughs> but uh, now we are monitoring social media for distress. Um, and, you know, the next question is, well, what, el like, what else should we be doing? Right. Uh, we, got, we got a lot of complaints. Um, we're using social media to say, hey, look how great the Coast Guard is. You know, look at this cool stuff we did. Yeah. Um, rather than saying, there's a storm coming, here's the information you need to know, here's where to go, here's the numbers to call, you know, save this number on to your, you know, whatever. Um, so there's a, there's a lot more to do with it. The one good thing is that our admirals now have uh, high school and college age children. So yeah. they, are, <laughs> they are a little more hip. Um, exactly. People that are senior to me are that it's like this generation that I don't want to do it, I don't want to learn about it, and it's, I'm not interested, and I think it's bad. And you know what? And, and along those lines, I work with, um, like I'm an engineer myself, but I also work with fresh college grads. So the things they're learning in technology now, you're right. We don't we don't understand. There's a lot of names that go around. I'm like, well, what the hell is that? <laughs> but the the point is that they could bring so much. Uh, so many good ideas to an organization. And what I find myself doing is being in the middle of these college grads mm -hmm. and senior management who has no idea yeah. what they're talking about. So they're like, what the hell is that? I'm gonna have to break it down yeah. and explain how this is gonna make their lives better. Yeah, there's some innovation <laughs> archetypes who are familiar with these, but the translator, the translator is like the most important yeah. person yeah. in the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Um, so my wife actually was, uh, was an SES or injustice, and she wound up having a lot of these same, it was the, the reactive versus the proactive. Yes. And it was a very reactive bureau that she's with, and she wound up really kind of hitting her head against the, the wall that the proactive would be a really good way to drive a better reaction. Yeah. But she couldn't make that that sort of leap for them. Does this help with that? It's like, we're not trying to be proactive, we're just trying to make the reactive better. What we can, yes, well, what we can, what the, how this really helps is to say, Get this problem statement is really, it's getting to the point that where now we can really define it. It's always been profound, but now we can say, look, guys, we have, like, we have to look forward. Like, you, we, I know you want to do it in robots. I know that you want to get rid of the helicopters and do this in robots, but you, we have to look forward. I don't know if it's actually made us more proactive, but it had definitely has, uh, has made us feel like you know, we need to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.